Hi, my name's Michael Gilmore, and I'm uh, one of the founders of actually ParkLogic.com and also the writer of WhizBang's blog. And it is so good to have you here with us um, to watch uh, Stephen Lieberman. Uh, he's going to be sharing a vast amount of experience he has in domain name law, and I'm so excited to hear what he has to say on that. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Stephen Lieberman and the webinar that was run earlier today. Thanks a lot for that. Bye. Wow. Fantastic. Anyway, it's great to have everyone here. Um, today we have a, a really good privilege of having Stephen Lieberman, um, an extraordinary um, domain lawyer in the domain industry and a vast amount of experience. And uh, can I just say, Stephen, it's really good to, to, to see you and appreciate your time. So, hi, it's how are you going? Pleasure being here, Michael. Oh, that's I... great. So, Stephen, um, can I just say, so tell us about yourself. What what is your background? Like so where did you go to school and stuff like that? Um I went to college, Bard College and then at Delphi, and then after that I went to the District Columbia School of Law. Um along the way I dabbled a little bit with human rights during law school. Oh, uh, you gotta tell and, us a bit uh, about that. Well, like what what sort of aspects there? Human rights is a fun area of law. It's um it's one of the few areas of law I know of that you're always doing good. Um, it, it, we I did a um, certificate at SCDW in Strasbourg, which was an enormous amount of fun um, and really quite interesting. Um, it was not an area of law I could see myself going into. Um, what with the travel and all that sort of stuff. I hate flying on planes. Yeah. Um, and it's not uh, all that easy. Can I just say, uh, I completely agree with you on that. Doing that trip from Australia, Melbourne, Australia, to the US, multiple times per year, 16 hours there, 16 hours back, I'm with you on the flying. So sorry, I interrupted. You've got to be good at it, though, by now. Uh, try, uh, what I do is I, I get on the plane, and I assume the fetal position like this, and I have my noise cancelling headphones on I go, uh, like that, and I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I interrupted you. Uh, well, no, I mean, it was just an area that, that I, I dabbled with for a little bit and then moved on. And, and, and I always was the one in law school who was playing with the computers and, uh, and things of that sort. And, and when I got out of law school, my very first job was uh, working for a patent firm. And that's so, where so I met my partner in the roughly? law firm. What, what, what year? Uh, 94. 94. Okay, so you're really young, just like me. Although I just got a few exactly. more great years. I'm, 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 I'm hoping that that we have another fifty to a hundred years. I mean, technology is getting better. Hopefully, we're practicing whatever we're practicing, be it law or, or business, in uh, year three thousand. Yeah, that sounds great. I'm looking forward to take the blue pill or the red pill. I'll take the red pill or something like that, and it'll make me feel a lot younger than I am. Exactly. <laughs> okay, so so you finished law school. Um, you went to start to work with a patent firm, and so what was the next part of your journey? After that, I mean, I was there for nine, ten months. Um, I met my the, my partner in my the current law firm, mm -hmm. and we actually set out to start the firm. Um, that was getting lots of credit cards and taking out a lot of advertising, and we started out as a patent application firm solely, uh, just writing patents for people. And we managed to survive and slowly expand into other areas, such as trademarks. Um, Deborah McCormick is a lady who joined us a few years later. Uh, she was a trademark attorney at uh, Shaw Pittman. And then over time, we brought in other attorneys who are of counsel and work with us a lot. Uh, such as a guy named David Shaheen, who does securities law and high-end corporate work. And as many of you know, uh, Phil Corwin does lobbying and a lot of other work um, in the domain industry. Because um, he sort Rachel of does Malcolm. a lot of the lobbying for the ICA, doesn't he? Yes, he does. He does a great job, by the way. He does do a great job. I could not do his job. It would... It, one, his ability to keep track of all of the information and everything that's going on all at once, I find astounding. Yeah. Um, and, and that and the constantly talking to everybody about everything that's going on, it's, it's a hard thing to do. Um, I like writing 
papers and doing research and filing lawsuits. So I tend to stay within that area, that in uh, talking about domain names and trademarks and doing contracts and things of that sort. We find that everyone sort of likes to do their own thing. Um, another one of the ladies we work with, Rachel Malkin, she's was been writing uh, software contracts for 30 odd years and that's what she likes to do wow. and she really doesn't like doing anything else. That, that's, so, a, that's a long time writing software contracts. An incredible amount of experience. Is. Yeah, so, so how did you, you, you established your firm, obviously very successful doing patents and stuff like that. And by the way, patent, uh, I've um, actually registered a number of patents and so forth along the years, and that's an amazing process in itself. Um, uh, and getting them through, one is partying with your money and like, finding out like a number of years later that you've actually got it. <laughs> it's just, um, it can take a while. It yeah. can take a long time. Uh, but it, you, I would imagine as a patent lawyer, you would have found some really interesting things along the way and people's different ideas, some crazy ones as well. Uh, we've had some strange, strange inventions come across our desk. Some are absolutely amazing technology. Um, and then we've had a few kooky things along the way as well. Um, perpetual motion machines. Oh, perpetual um, motion. Oh, they're just oh, awesome. yeah. I don't think there's those things you go to YouTube and you see all those weird, wonderful, like perpetual motion machines. There's always two or three out there. I'm just waiting for the one that's actually going to work. Yeah, the one that breaks the compl all the laws of physics. Right. Uh, it's going to happen. That, that, you know um, Captain Picard had one of those. Is that right in Star Trek? <laughs> I, I've never had Mr. Picard as a client. I'm hoping oh, to, yeah, but he's I'm never hopefully. graced our door. <laughs> that sounds great. So you're journeying along your way, and you come across domain names. Like, can you, was there an epiphany or a moment where you saw your first domain name? You thought, oh, my gosh, like this seems like a really awesome area to get into. I, well, it didn't really happen that way. I I'd actually knew about domain names and had a number of pretty good ones. And then back then being really, really broke, this was being before law school, um, dropped them and, and because they were $35 a year. Yeah, well, um, way too much Unfortunately. Money. Way, well, I thought it was then. Yeah. Uh, so th did you see them sell for a number of million dollars now each? <laughs> a number of them, yes. Oh, but, no. Oh, well. <laughs> How have we um, all made that that, that mistake? Uh, probably. Yeah. I, if if hindsight, if I go back and tell myself to do things differently, there's a lot of domain names I would have bought. There's no question let me, about it. Let me it. tell you, I was in Japan. I was doing some contract work for the um, Australian Embassy at the time, and I was invited to the launch of the internet in Japan. And I said, Nah, I can't be bothered going to that. <laughs> Hey. I'm, I'm thinking, oh, <laughs> I said, no, I'll stay in the hotel room, read a book or something. What's this? What's this? What do I want to get involved in that for? But anyway. <laughs> oh well, yeah. I mean, that's the same yeah. thing. Hindsight. So, so, so you had all the, you had a few domain names, and you, you went through law school. You established your firm. Obviously, quite successful. And as you got more and more different attorneys on board and expanded, um, then what caused you to to start getting into the domain name law space? Was it just um, natural actually, I, I met a guy named um, Tony Inalganum, um who uh, runs a company called FMA. And he had a whole bunch of different interesting things to do, and, and we did a number of lawsuits for him, and a lot of them were centered around domain names. And um, he was the reason, I think, that I really started getting into it and really started appreciating what domains were and where to go. And, and what sort of a business it could be. And I met, I went to the first traffic conference because of him. Um, and Was met a lot of Delray? The, the very first one in Delray? I don't remember exactly where it was, to be perfectly okay. honest. I think it was in Delray. I, um, the only traffic long conference time ago I've missed is that point. one. Uh, I've been to all the others. It, it, it feels like a long time ago at this point. <laughs> yeah, I imagine so. So, so, so you you went to the traffic conference, and then you obviously established some contacts there and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. Met a lot of people. Yeah, it's funny. I was just saying I was there. It was a long time ago in Delray. So, but anyway, um, so so you obviously established a whole lot of lot of experience in intellectual property 
in your in your law firm and domain names naturally flew out of that uh, we've done a large number of lawsuits pertaining to domain names, a large number of UDRPs, a uh, substantial number of escrow transactions, uh, some really strange, twisted, do this, then do that, and then do this, and then do that type sort of thing um, in escrow transactions. Um, helped people with some owner finance deals along the way. And um, yeah, I mean, we've, we've done pretty much all the different areas when it comes to domain names. I've even been an expert as pertaining to domain names in a number of lawsuits. Fantastic. So, so here's a question for the people on this call, the people who are going to be watching the, uh, the webinar um, uh, on video. Is what, what should they be thinking about when they're wanting to sell a domain name or, or acquire a domain name? What are the things that they need to really think about? Um, in that process, because I think a lot of people in the domain industry, my experience for many years was send money by PayPal to someone you've never met on the other side of the world. It could be a hundred thousand bucks. They send you a portfolio of domain names or or a domain name you want to acquire, and it was all done in a handshake essentially. But things have changed I, since then. So um, yeah, it has. It has definitely changed since then. And as a side note, I actually saw a million dollar transaction happen. Uh, on a handshake and a PayPal transaction. Um, Trust me, I was on, on holidays one time and uh, I bought a portfolio of domains and I called up my banker and I said, look, do you, can you just transfer a significant sum of money, I'll leave it as that, to some bank in Malta? <laughs> and uh, the bank said, pardon me, and I said, yeah, can you just do that? And, and they did that for me and I sent the paperwork afterwards. And I got my got the domain name and that sort of stuff back, and there was no contracts, there was nothing, and it was all done on reputation. Yeah. So, so what what should we be looking for now? Because, like I said, things have changed. Things have changed. The domain community is much larger than it was a decade ago. Yeah, um, that's for sure. Domain names are now clearly known to be of value, um, and not everybody in the domain industry is trustworthy or well-known. Um, so obviously the first stop you're going to go to is let's do a contract. Um, second stop you're going to do is let's do it as an escrow transaction. Make sure you know the escrow agent. Um, and then there's a lot of ways to structure deals. Um, we see an enormous number of transactions where, which are payment over time um, and uh, sometimes it's where the where the domain owner will say, "All right, I'll hold the. Uh, you can pay me a thousand dollars a month for 36 months, as as an example. And if you don't make all of the payments, then um, I get to keep all the money." Yeah. Well, that's that's one way of doing it. Um, other times, people will buy the uh, company that owns the domain name. Um, there's obvious advantages to that because if you don't uh, if you do that, then there's no change of ownership. It's the same company. Mm -hmm. So it makes it a lot easier if, that if somebody else is going to come back and say, oh, it's a change of ownership. We had a trademark prior to it. And, and, and they, now, now you have to give it up and give it to us. So, so just, just if I can interrupt there. So why do you find that um, acquirers are now using like payment plans versus here's the cash up front, see you later? Is it just a risk mitigation strategy or they don't have the cash and they're wanting to reduce the, the amount of cash outlay up front? Like, what are you seeing amongst the particular um, buyers out there? I think it's a little bit of both. Um, I think there's a lot of people thinking a lot about the um, tax uh, ramifications as well. Yeah. Um, that if things are going on more than a year, then you, and then the income could be uh, long-term capital gains mm. as opposed to regular income. Obviously, you're, at least in the U.S., I, I don't I don't know the tax laws where you are. Yeah, um, trust I don't know them either. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody must. I promise. No, Somebody no, it's, must. It's, it's, it's amazing. I'll just digress for a second. I actually wrote a blog post just on a very simple one on capital gains tax. And of just keeping track of how much you bought, bought something for and how much you sold something for. It's something we do at Park Logic, my company, uh, for clients. And 
The thing I'm amazed at is the number of domainers who actually don't keep accurate record records, and they they lose a huge amount of money because of that. Uh, because oh, they could sure. be writing off a lot of a lot of a lot of losses and stuff. The other thing I notice that none of the domainers do is that a lot of domainers will go ahead and they'll be like, "All right, I'm going to." sell this domain name and use the money to buy the, these domain names or sell 10 domain names and buy another domain name. Yeah. In the US we have something called the 1031 exchange which allows you to um, buy and sell things of like kind and ex basically exchanging one for the other and obviously domain names are of like kind yeah. and therefore you don't have to pay taxes on it. Um, and I rarely see domainers doing 1031 exchanges. Um, and if you're doing a large transaction, it makes logical sense. Why would you want to pay taxes on something and then buy the, the exact same sort of thing when you can put off paying those taxes for many years and really, you know, in the end, as long as you can show, put every, all the paper down on a table and show the IRS exactly what you did and they have to shrug and walk away, that's the way to do it. Yeah, um, yeah, that, that's, that's the key thing. Um, um, like I said, we are digressing a bit on tax and all that sort of stuff. Uh, I remember I showed this particular domain or the, the way we track capital gains tax, what you buy and sell and spit out a report and all that sort of thing for our system. And he said, said to me, what's capital gains tax? With which case, Oh, you're kidding me. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not, I'm not kidding. This, <laughs> is, this is actually quite a, quite a prominent domain in the industry. What's capital gains tax? I said, well, when you put your taxation in, you know, your tax in, in each year and... Uh, he said, well, I haven't done one for like five or six years. And I said, well, I don't think you'll be using this part of our system. <laughs> it's just like, it's, it's, it's a funny thing. Uh, the tax law, like, uh, um, we, we got audited actually uh, quite recently on GST tax. And they end up owing us money, which is, I went to my business partner. I said, okay, so you're telling me we're paying too much tax? <laughs> What's going on here? Yeah, but uh, it, it's an important part of business though, isn't it? It is. We we actually have a CPA that's part of our firm um, for that purpose. And over the years, we've educated him, and I guess he's educated us as well about um, uh, about about taxes and domain names and and how to save money. Uh, there was an inch. I don't, I don't know if you've noticed. A lot of people in the domain industry seem to be going into Bitcoin, and there was a ruling recently saying that uh, Bitcoins and other types of virtual currencies, something like uh, like Second Life was another. They have a they have a virtual currency as Million well. Um, yeah. It well, it's all considered property. So until you take that property out, the money out of that virtual currency, you don't have to pay taxes on it. Interesting. Pretty, it's pretty fascinating. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So I've got to ask a question before we get get back to the the deal making and the best way to do deals. What is a domain name? What is a domain name? Is, is it well, a domain asset? name is, is it an asset, a contract right? Is it a black hole expense? Like, what is it? It completely depends where you are in the country. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. At least in the U.S. Yeah. Um, in California, it's a property right. I would consider it an intellectual property right. Um, according to the IRS, it's an intellectual property right. In Virginia, uh, it's the subject of a service. Um, and is therefore going to be taxed differently. Um, yeah. So there is no good answer. I could tell you a domain name is not a trademark. Yeah. It's an interesting <laughs> question because we actually took this question to one of the, the, the top law firms, um, tax law firms in Australia. And uh, uh, we said, what is a domain name? <clears throat> and the guy had never thought about it before. And uh, we had a really interesting conversation at the end of which he said, pay me $20,000. I'd love to do a research paper on this. <laughs> and, uh, and we said, well, no, we won't do that. Uh, so we took a particular tack on it. But it's like th there's, a, uh, there's a lot of um, issues around do you actually control the domain name if someone like I can can take it off you any time? So you actually don't control it. So it's not an asset because an asset is defined as you control it. Um, and th then there's, there's lots of things around, maybe it's like an insurance contract, like Virginia, I guess, is doing, where it expires over mm -hmm. time, uh, right. at the end of it, which you don't own it. So you may have paid a million dollars for a domain name, and you potentially can amortize that across like 12 months, and then it's now worth $8.95. Right. Uh, well, I mean, there's been recent cases in the U.S. 
where the valuation of domain names is based upon what you actually sell it for, not any uh, estimated amount. I mean, obviously, large numbers of the parking companies will say, oh, yeah, I'll give you an estimate on how much you could sell the thing, about, thing for, and that's the value. Well, no, it's not. There's been specific rulings in, at least in Maryland, that say that the value is the amount that you're paying for it in, you know, eight, nine dollars. Yeah. Even if it's, I don't know, buy.com until you actually sell it. And then that would establish the actual value. So what happens if you, um, so the amount you might purchase buy.com for, if you purchase it for like $2 million, but you sold for $5 million, um, well, does that count as the a value $2 million changes. capital gain? It's just like a house. I mean, you buy a, a, what, what, what somebody's willing to pay for it. That's yeah. the value that it comes down to. Or does, it, <clears throat> or does it depend where you are? So if you're in Virginia, the end of 12 months, you can write off like $2 million worth of capital, uh, um, capital gain as such. You write it off because it's worth $8.95 now. But then when you sell for $5 million, you got $5 million of capital, capital um, uh, gain. From a tax point of view, from a federal tax point of view, a domain name is clearly intellectual property. Yeah. No, That's, it's, there's it's, been it's a an ruling from that point of view. Yeah, it's a really interesting and, area. And what, one of the things I found was that um, uh, it, uh, it really depends, like you say, what state you're in or what country you're from. It really depends on how you should account for your domain names. Right. And that's a key Definitely. thing for domainers is that they need to be doing that sort of thing, shouldn't they? Of course. They, I mean, look, everything when it comes to business is strategy. Yeah. That you want to make the most possible amount of money and keep as much of that cash in your pocket. And part of the strategy is not paying the, uh, paying the lowest possible taxes. Or paying the fair um, amount. Well, no. Paying the lowest possible amount of taxes based upon the law. Yes, correct. The law in every correct. single state is different. <laughs> the law in every single country is different. Uh, uh, you can uh, vote with your feet. Oh, I don't want to I don't want to follow these rules in this state. Move. Yeah. Exactly. Well, it's funny, you know, like as I said to my wife as we're driving on the freeway, I said, "Honey, we built this section." Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we pay for this. This is our taxes. Yeah, our taxes at work. But let's just move back on to the deal structure. So you, you're, um, you mentioned a couple of things that, um, that people are wanting to, to spread the payments across time. One is for risk mitigation, and uh, the, other th the other reason is there's just not as much money going around. Are you seeing a lot more of the is it, is it depressed prices or increased prices for domainers? Um, uh, I've seen an increase in price on high-end dot-coms. Yeah. I've seen a lowering of price on uh, second and third level domain names, certainly other TLDs. Yeah. Um, and well, I think, why that's, do you think because, that's the case. Well, I mean, obviously, there's a lot more TLDs available. Yeah. Um, there's obviously a lot more people also in, in the industry trying to buy and sell them. Um, but also, the value, what, the money you can take out on lower level domain names, domains that get a lot less traffic, is lower because the parking companies are paying a lot less. Yeah. So it's basically the wholesale markets become depressed. Right. Um, to a great degree. Yeah. So uh, so here, here's another question then. So uh, the ways that structure a deal, uh, do you have a preference for um, doing a transaction which is give me the cash, see you later, or you actually don't mind some of these payment term type deals? Um, or, or what, I don't mind. Preference? Look, look, I mean, in the end, everyone's going to do, do the deal that's best for them. Um, obviously, cash is king. If someone's willing to hand you a million dollars, take it and walk away. Yeah. Um, you know, bird in hand and all that sort of stuff. On the other hand, I done escrow over the last six months for seven or eight different substantial deals, and every last one of them has been um, payments over time. Hmm. Um, and substantial contracts where there is negotiations not just pertaining to, you know, what's going to happen to the money if we can't finish it, also about who owns the improvements. Who, impro who owns the goodwill? Is the ownership going to transfer now, or is the ownership going to transfer later? Um, what about the trademark? 
um, is, is, if there's a registered trademark, does it transfer now, does it transfer later? Um, one deal we did, the domain name was uh, leased for a dollar, and the as and the trademark was the thing that was uh, licensed, and it gave them a right to buy the uh, domain name itself. Um, at the end of uh, I think it was about a years years long contract. Okay. Um, you know, there's a lot of different ways to uh, skin it, skin the fish, so to speak, or skin the duck. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's it's it's, it's, a, it's an interesting question um, of. Uh, do, you, do you find many of these sort of deals, they, in the process of negotiating them through, because they get more and more complex, do, they, do you find that they fall to pieces or do they actually, in some ways your experience is the more complex they get, the, the more committed the buyer comes to concluding the contract? I, I don't think there's a real answer to that. Yeah. Um, I've seen a number of deals that are quite complex that have fallen apart at the very end. Um, and I've seen some simple deals that have fallen apart. And the simple deals usually fall apart because of lack of money. The complex yeah. deals fall apart because either people are, don't have the money, can't, can't maintain it, um, or there's a lack of will to get to the end, so to speak. Mm. Um, I saw one or two badly put together deals where we were the escrow agent where there was not sufficient money up front so there wasn't sufficient reason for the buyer to stay in. Uh, if I was going to give a piece of advice, I would say always make sure that the buyer has skin in the game. Yeah. Because if they don't and they find that they're not making money off the domain name a couple of months in or six months in, whatever it is, they'll just walk away because it doesn't cost them anything to walk away. Yeah, in the meanwhile, they may have damaged your domain or something like that. Let's imagine they decide to do a whole lot of spam off it. <laughs> Some of the risks, right. I guess, associated with it, which which brings up the issue of the contracts. Do you, in the the construction of the contract, limit what the buyer can do until the transfer is actually complete? I mean, that's more of a business point. I would like to limit it substantially and say, what are you going to do with this domain name, and. Uh, limit their ability to use the domain name for that purpose. On the other hand, this seller, if the seller is motivated, he's going to back off on those types of uh, deal points because he wants to get the deal done or she wants to get the deal done. Yeah. So that's not really a substantial, it, you know, it, again, it, it's, it's how much is it going to cost and who's the more motivated person in the deal. Yeah, it, it's a, it was an interesting question I know has been asked of me a number of times by different domain owners. They say, okay, I've got this great payment plan. Uh, what happens if the person decides to um, send out a million spam emails off my domain at month two and they've got like 50 bucks in escrow? <laughs> Actually, so they don't really care. So they go along and damage the actual domain name. Is there then uh, any sort of rights for them to go back and sort of say, well, hang on a second here. You broke the law on my domain name, uh, and you have damaged my intellectual property. Is there any way for them to get recourse in those circumstances, or is that just too hard? Well, I mean, remember, a contract is a contract. Yeah. So if you don't think about it beforehand, you're not going to get the rights later on. Yeah. If you don't put in, you have to buy it if you, if you harm the intellectual property you're sort of out of it. Now, there is a concept called um, good faith and fair dealing in contracts yeah. that if something is essentially intimated and there's no four corners clause in the contract, then there might be a way of filing a lawsuit and pushing somebody into it. Um, we did do a deal a number of years ago where that was a concern and not exactly that, but pretty close. And they, the the seller forced the buyer to get obtain a million dollar insurance policy to cover any possibility of damage. Yeah. Now, I don't know how how expensive that insurance policy was. I do know that um, patent um, patent prosecution uh, insurance is very expensive. Trademark as as is trademark prosecution. Um, and when I say prosecution, prosecution of litigation, not of the yeah. process of obtaining the intellectual property. Whereas like trademark, uh, many business plan insurance 
business insurance plans actually include trademark defense as almost a part or, a, or an inexpensive rider. Yeah. So you don't know, and it, that sounds like a um, prosecution type of insurance, so it would probably be pretty expensive. I, I would think so. But it's something I think that, um, maybe domain owners should be aware of, is that uh, I've noticed there's been a, a, a quite a substantial movement to payment terms over time and that sort of stuff, as you were saying. And there's risks, hidden risks associated with that, and they're not just financial of someone defaulting but they could damage the intellectual property and they may want to consider that when putting together a deal to speak to someone like yourselves, your firm and something and so forth. Right. We can always guide people and tell them what the different risks are and where yeah. to go when it, when it comes down to it. We've done a lot of these contracts, so it's really not that hard to foresee the problems. And that's yeah. the whole point of contracts, to foresee the problems and say what happens when they happen. And hopefully they never happen. But no, absolutely. So, as, as people, you always say, so say is that you sign the contract and you put it in the drawer and you, and you hope you never have to pull it out. But gee, you're glad right. when you've got it, <laughs> uh, if you do. So just moving on. OK, so buying the company, you, you mentioned that's one of the other options, is the domains are part of a company. And so you, you, you want to buy that domain from someone, you decide, I'm going to buy the company. Um, or let's imagine you have your domain and you want to sell it to someone um, and it's inside of a company. So what are the pros and cons of this uh, that you've seen in your experience? Well, the pros are obvious. That, that there, there's, the domain name stays with the same registrant. Um, and there's really no issue pertaining to having to assert tacking, which is when one trademark owner transfers a uh, trademark from one person to another. So the goodwill is definitely there. Um, oftentimes, that that when you're doing that, you're also buying all of the improvements on the domain name, um, the website, um, any software that's associated with it, etc. Um, and 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 it's a much easier transaction. It, you could do a stock transaction, or you can do an asset deal. The um, a, the um, Asset deal is buying all the assets out of the company, yeah. which isn't quite as good. If you're buying the company, you're buying the stock of the company. And the obvious negative side of that is then you have to put something in that says that you're not responsible for the debts of the corporation. That mm -hmm. corporation could have filed and, and could have many, many debts and or other issues and or have caused some third party damages, in which case you have to be very, very careful that you don't inherit those things. Yeah, there's a lot of things um, in representations and warranties and everything like that associated with the company and um, and so forth, correct? Right. We um, we use we use the buying of the company regularly when we're transferring registrars. Um, and because there's so many issues pertaining to ICANN, it's just a lot easier just to sell the stock of the company and then keep moving. And then we use the standard types of things you just mentioned. Yeah. Um, when we when we transfer those, yeah. So we've talked about some deal structures. Um, the one the one that is becoming a lot more popular, which is more than just like payment over time, it's more of leasing. Um, so they actually have like a a right for a period of time. Would that be correct? Um, sure. People do leases over time. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you, yearly leases, monthly leases. Um, and people do leases to buy. That's a very regular thing that we're seeing a lot of. That you know, you do a lease. The the uh, money from the lease goes against the sales amount, and then there's a bubble at the very end to buy it off. Or they could say, no, I don't want to. I, I don't want to buy the domain name and walk away. And obviously, yeah. since it's a lease, the money is going directly to the person. The negative side to doing the lease for the seller is that it's a um, uh, back to taxes, here we go, is um, it's regular income as opposed to long-term capital gains. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you're going to pay a higher tax. Um, I've, we've also seen a number of uh, deals where people uh, do a combination. It's a part lease, part owner finance, part finance from a third party. Okay. Um, so it can go in lots of different directions. And I guess another way of actually, say, financing some of these deals is owner finance deals. Right. Um, That's one of the things I just mentioned. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, 
Um, is, is there anything sort of gotchas you should be aware of with those sort of deals? The only one is make sure that uh, the things that we've been talking about, that if that somebody could harm the domain name and somebody could just stop paying and walk away. Mm -hmm. So you have to be very, very careful. You make sure that the money that gets paid in stays with the uh, with the person who's doing the financing and um, that you keep control over the domain name, put it into escrow. Um, a cost of a lawsuit to get the domain name back is very, very expensive. So it's much easier to put it into escrow, pay the escrow fees. They're de minimis against the cost of litigation to try and get it back. Yeah. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot of these domain theft deal, domain thefts these days, and the only way really to get it back, in most cases, the uh, the thief is act gaining access to the owner's um, email address, so you can can't use the uh, interregistrar um, dispute process. So you have to file a lawsuit. Lawsuits hmm. cost money, and you're usually ending up in federal court in that case. But which, which let's just talk about this um, domain theft a little bit more. So, are you seeing a lot more domain theft happening? Oh, enormously. Um, in the last week, I think we've had um, three. We're doing two domain theft lawsuits right now. Um, we've done probably 20, 25 different lawsuits. Uh, or yeah. at least beginning of lawsuits in, so, in some cases and actual filings in other cases pertaining to domain theft. Um, we've spoken to the FBI on two different transactions. Um, there's one person out there that seems to be stealing a lot of domain names from uh, Enom and transferring them to GoDaddy. Um, there's another guy that's, um, uh, we think he's somewhere in the Middle East and he seems to be very good at gaining access to people's accounts and transferring domains to himself. Um, so yeah, there seems to be a lot more domain theft, and I think it's because people realize domain names are of real value. It's not like 10 years ago where people like domain names, ugh, what are they, $35? It, yeah. It's a whole other world. People see in the newspaper, you know, um, what was that one? The, um, Business.com, I think I, well, I think that was a business. That was Mark right? Trotsky sold that for a few million bucks or something. I thought it was, wasn't it like 11 or something? I don't remember. Oh, no, that, that, was, an, that was another one. Um, yeah, I, I can't remember exactly. But, right, but yeah. you know, I mean, there's some really high transaction uh, domain yeah. sales, and they're, all, they're in the newspapers, so the thieves see it, and they're like, wow, I can make a lot of money. Now they turn around and they try and sell it for... Um, you know, ten or twenty thousand dollars. But if you're stealing something and you can take the money and run, yeah. they're they're doing okay from that point of view. So yeah, you it's it's really good to make sure your domains are locked, and it's even better if you have your own registrar. Costs or using going to a small registrar instead of a big registrar. The small registrars will um, take more personal interest and really try and lock the. Um, domain names, and the thieves will not have um, as easy a chance and we won't be as familiar with the controls within that particular registrar. Now, obviously, there's negative sides to going to small registrars, but I always find it's easier to talk to the owner of the company when you do. Yeah, no, it's, um, uh, how about other things like making sure your, your password and your email address is actually quite complex and change regularly? Would, would that help? You mean you're not supposed to make your password the word password? Yeah, for some strange reason. I don't know what it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, like I, I, it's funny in my own thing. I, I've got probably we all do this. We have multiple levels of passwords. Yeah, some passwords you really don't care if someone can work it out, but other things completely random. <laughs> it's just um, uh, bears no resemblance to my life whatsoever. <laughs> well, that's a good thing. I I close my eyes and slap my hands on the keyboard to get my passwords. That, that, that sounds good. So um, <coughs> just just moving on right now. Uh, do you find, obviously, as a lawyer, you, you find uh, using a contract is obviously important, but is it always important? Like, are these big transactions still being done on a handshake? Yes, there are definitely some that are being done on a handshake. Um, I don't know why, but I actually haven't seen any bad 
things happening because of the ones that are happening on a handshake because they're usually happening with people who are insiders within the domain industry and again when you're an insider within the industry and people know you and we know you live on your reputation yeah um, they're 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 moving forward without any real issues and yeah we've seen some really substantial deals without any contracts at all so yes I still think as an attorney it's far better to have a contract because you know th that old telephone thing where every single person whis whispers in the ear and to the next person the next person you get a completely different message uh, people can misunderstand what you say um, if it's down in writing then then there's no misunderstanding that the deal is the deal is the deal yeah but they still happen and I'm glad they still happen because I like the small industry I think there's something very nice about it there's but it's something still not special the about it isn't it yeah very yeah, much. and I think that's why we're we're all involved in the industry. So just just taking a look at this, uh, moving on. Trademax. Uh, this is a love. I think <laughs> domainers have a love hate relationship with Trademax, and <laughs> of course, uh, and they love them because when they have them, but they hate them because everything's been trademarked. Um, well, everything. Like, how been do you trademarked. defend yourself against these sort of things, and what should you be looking looking out for? There's some obvious checks though. So. So can you sort of take it from the other side of the fence where you're trying to get a domain, potentially from a domainer, um, and what is the, the potential trademark owner? What's their view of the world? Well, I, I think they're, they're, it's somewhat narrow. They think that, oh, I have a trademark, because most trademark owners don't really understand trademarks. Oh, it's clearly mine. They have my domain name. Um, but that's not obviously true. The trademarks are broken up into, um, well, one, they're based upon a country-by-country -country basis, mm -hmm. two people, um, and then they're broken up into goods and services. The whole goal behind trademarks is to avoid confusion. So one person can have uh, the mark Bluebird and use it for, I don't know, uh, screen monitors. Another person could have the mark Bluebird and use it for selling, I don't know, horses. Um, and they can advertise right next to each other and there's never going to be an issue because um, there's no possibility that the consuming public is going to think somebody who sells monitors also sells horses. Um, on the other hand, both of them may want the domain name bluebird.com. So who gets it? And the answer to that is whoever gets there first. On the other hand, if um, there are such a things as trademarks that are famous, uh, examples of famous trademarks, and I guess these companies will be happy that I say them, things like Nike. Um, Coca-Cola? Coca-Cola. I think they said Coca-Cola is the most valuable trademark in the world. Yeah. Um, if you have Coca-Cola.com, you're not going to get to keep it. <laughs> It's just as simple as that. One, in the United States, there's a law called uh, the Dilution Act. Um, um, and that says that they can have a right and gross to, um, th they can stop other people from using their trademark in other goods and services because the consuming public is going to assume that if you have the domain name Coca-Cola.com and you're put selling a product, even horses, that it would be put out by that company that is known as Coca-Cola. So, so I couldn't um, have um, a business decide to manufacture tiddlywinks and call my business Coca-Cola tiddlywinks and then uh, then um, have Coca-Cola.com. No, you definitely could not. On the other hand, remember also Coca-Cola has probably registered the, the term Coca-Cola in most countries around the I'd world. I'd say every country. <laughs> Yeah, I haven't been everywhere. Yeah. I certainly haven't searched <laughs> everywhere. I'd be willing to bet at least ninety percent, maybe them all. But yeah. I, I'm sure there's some little country where they don't have a filing. But the um, interesting trip from one was something like Coca-Cola. I, I, cola is not a trademark, though. Because no, because there's lots of different, different types of colas. Yeah. Cola is 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 one of those. I guess it's that sweet brown drink. Yeah, it's a generic. Um, yeah, it's a generic. Pe Pepsi is a cola. It's Pepsi Cola. Yeah. Um, I'm sure there's some others. I'm not a big soda drinker, so. <laughs> so, so just <laughs> coming back to well. the trademark owners. So, when you work with the trademark owners, do they sort of take the attitude of, 
these cyber squatters, they're sitting on my domain. Um, I've got a trademark. I want you to go and get them. Um, they can want that, but that doesn't mean they're always going to get what they want. Yeah. Um, you, nobody can have a right and gross uh, most of the time to any particular term. Um, a right and gross means the, the right to um, that term for all different goods and services. The, the, the real question is whether it's your, that other person's use is confusingly similar. So, uh, you know, you take generic, generic marks and you also have, you know, the word apple is a great example because um, apple is a fruit. We all know it very well. And then you've got Apple computers. Apple computers can stop people from using anything that, that might be confusingly similar with their use. Computers, technology, things like that. But they'll never stop people from using the word for the fruit because I can guarantee you that the Apple uh, was around long before Apple computers. I think they have it in a picture in Adam and Eve. I think Steve Wozniak would probably dispute that, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to have a chat with him about it. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's so it's so true. But I guess I'm, what I'm after is um, your sense of what is there. What do you find is pervading um, attitudes of some of the trademark owners? Do they understand that this is an industry that they're dealing with, and the industry has value and and, and so forth, or are they sort of taking that old cyber squatter mentality? Um, like, are they are they angry? Are they just go and get it for me? Like, what what, what is or they commercial about this? That okay, look, they got the domain first. We should pay fifty grand for that domain, and we're done with it. Well, I think nobody wants to pay more than they have to. Yeah. And I have come across many times where where clients who said, "Well, let's go file the UDRP. Maybe they won't respond. We know we don't have much of a right, because we'll tell them you don't have much of in the way of rights." Um, but file it and let's see if we can get away with it. Maybe they don't have enough money to litigate. Um, and, and I'm sure larger companies take much the same attitude that, oh, you know, maybe we can uh, litigate against, this, against these people and take the domain away from them. It's going to cost $200,000 to buy the domain name and we could probably bury them with $50,000 in federal litigation. Um, I'm sure that's an attitude that, that comes up pretty regularly. On the other hand, I'm sure there's many people who are quite respectful and say, look, we have this trademark. As long as you don't use it on our particular goods and services, at which we do have a registered trademark for, then have at it. Use the domain name for you want, for whatever you want. The problem with um, that is that a lot of domainers are still doing parking. And the essence of optimization of parking is putting uh, the advertisements on the site that will garner the most income, and therefore that means the largest number of people um, will click on it, high CTR. Mm -hmm. So that means that if a company is pushing their advertising very hard, um, and maybe even pushing their advertising very hard with Google, then Google will optimize those ads on the uh, parking page to be that which is going to most probably infringe. Yeah, it's interesting it's not to say Google's that. Problem. Yeah, it's it's interesting to say that we actually spend quite a bit of our time for for, for some clients uh, that request or sort of service of keywording away from the trademark owners um, to make sure there's no and you do whatever best you can to be able to do that. Um, but you're right, there are some risks um, in that regard. Um, particularly for high value domains, uh, and you've got to really be careful with them and also where you pack them and what you can and cannot control on the page. Absolutely. Yeah. Look, if you have a really high value domain name, it doesn't make an enormous amount of sense to um, park it. You really need to build it out because you're going to, in the long run, you're going to garner secondary meaning from that high value domain name. Um, secondary meaning is um, when you associate a particular word, even if it's a generic, with some other uh, goods and services that are not associated with that generic. Obvious example, I'll go back to Apple, is, is Apple for computers. 
um, which is the secondary meaning that Apple has approached. I'm sure if I did a trademark search, there's a number of people that have used the term Apple for lots of other things. In fact, I know there's an Apple courier service yeah. in the area that we use pretty regularly. Um, so they've, in my mind, have secondary meaning. Apple in secondary meaning has, has secondary meaning for courier services as well. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it, it, it's a waste to leave a high-value domain name on pure parking um, unless you're being very, very careful and making sure that it's not infringing on one of these other companies' marks. Um, yeah, which brings up to the next question. I'm, I've got a really high-value domain. Let's imagine I've got a high-value domain, and I'm going to sell it. Um, so I'm not going to pack it, like you said, and take your advice. I'm not going to necessarily pack it. Um, so I'm going to forego some of that revenue. So I'm thinking, well, how do I sell this thing? Uh, what should I be doing? So I think, think, well, if I build it out, like you said, develop it, is that going to add value to the transaction with a particular buyer or detract value? I actually, the reason why I'm asking that question, is, I actually wrote a blog post on this um, just recently, so I'd be interested in, in you know, your, your opinion on that with your experience in the buying side now. Well, I always think the, a business sells for a lot more than just a domain name. Um, and, and domain names are there to have a business. That's much the purpose. It's so people can find you. Um, on the other hand, um, people will argue, and as I'm sure you would, that associating that particular domain name with secondary meaning that is not that which the new owner is going to want um, could lower the value. On the other hand, secondary meaning can be changed and there can be multiple secondary meanings hmm. to a particular domain and the words associated with it. It's interesting your point of view there. Um, in, um, in my blog article I actually wrote and I said, look, if you're in the domain selling business, sell the domains. <laughs> the focus on doing that and that's really what you're doing. And I wrote up to, I think it's part nine on how to sell, a, sell high value domains. Um, but uh, what you may want to do is take a domain and build it into a business and then repeat. Right. Um, and so you end up, like you're saying, selling the businesses. But uh, I think I actually find in transactions it can quite often muddy the water. Um, oh, it can. There's yeah. no question about it. Because now you're not just dealing with the domain name. You're dealing with all the other things that go with it because yeah. the business is a complicated, messy thing. Yeah. You yeah. know, there's yeah. other contracts. There's other deals. Uh, there, there's other assets that get built in, people buy servers, people buy all these different sorts of things to make things move forward. And, and you've got to uh, be, you, know, um, you sort of sort of try and think, am I going to get the value from all my effort to build this thing out and turn it into a business, business in some ways from the buyer? If they don't value that part, then all they value is the domain name. Right, exactly. Yeah, so, so there's no really good answer. Yeah. I, I mean, you... In many ways, I think the guys who are putting up websites that say these domain names are for sale, I'm in the business of selling domain names, are the safest. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. It really is. It really is interesting. Um, is there anything particular you want to bring up just now before I'm going to throw it open to the um, attendees and sort of if they've got any questions? So just while um, Stephen wraps up some of his thoughts. Um, as well. If you want to type in the box any questions you have, I'll actually um, probably take, because there's a number of people on the call, we'll just have the questions in the box and I can read them out to, to Stephen. Um, and uh, so Stephen, do you want to share anything else just then and to wrap things up? I, you know, the comment is really, is, is, is really a simple one. Transactions may look simple, but there's often things that you're not going to see. If you haven't done it a thousand times, if you've done it a thousand times and you really know what you're doing, then just go ahead and do it. But oftentimes, bringing an attorney in order that knows the different ins and outs, who's done it a thousand times, is obviously of assistance. Um, it's a great and wonderful thing when people can do transactions on a handshake. Um, it warms it warms my heart and makes me smile. But that's rare. It's far better to write a contract and make sure everything is clear. Yeah, couldn't agree with you more. Um, 
and uh, it's 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 always in some ways seller seller beware if you're selling your domain and buyer beware as well when you're buying. But there's right. a, a question that's come through: which of the new GTLDs are most interesting for investors? In your in your opinion, there, Steve? Wow, that's, that's a big a question. One. I know that's a huge question. In fact, <laughs> we should have a uh, a, a um, webinar just on the new GTLD space. I think. <laughs> Um, the answer to that is not talking about a particular GTLD. I mean, Wayne, we can always talk about which ones we think are good, and a lot of that's just a guess. I think the reality of um, GTLDs is the company that's going to promote it the most and get it known the most are going to be the GTLDs that are going to do the best. Because in the, everyone knows about .com. It's been around forever. The only way people are going to know about all these other GTLDs, and there's a lot of them, is if somebody tells the world about them. Um, and that takes advertising and money. So which companies have the most money and the most impetus to invest in advertising? Um, I mean, let's look at it. We've got uh, Google, Amazon, Web.com. Was it Amazon's <laughs> um, put in applications for 74? I don't remember the exact number. It was a substantial yeah, number. A I lot. think Google was 101. Yeah. I don't know how, how many web.com has. And there's obviously uh, Donuts that has a ton. 304. I don't know why these numbers are sticking in my mind. <laughs> One wonders about you remembering all these yeah, things. Exactly. <laughs> no, no, I actually find this an interesting space. Um, and... Uh, I was talking to someone just recently about just just sharing my thoughts on new GTLDs, and I, I, a thing I really struggle with still, if for most of them, is the business model for the domain investor. Is where they're going to well, get the return? Well, it's tough. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the 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 business investor is is making a guess. Yeah. If if you're doing it tru uh, truly on just investing in the domain itself, you know, again, who's going who's gonna to promote that GTLD the most? Or is there something about, you know, a, a business investor can take another point of view. I'm going to go for the really high-end uh, three-letter, four-letter, five-letter uh, word dot something, and I'm going to do the promotion myself. Yeah. That's, then that's you're building the a business, other. though. There's a couple of other right. questions here, uh, Stephen. Um, one is from Dante. Um, mm -hmm. On a payment term deal where the domain is held by the escrow agent, how do buyers respond to your law firm as the escrow agent as opposed, as opposed to, say, escrow.com? Um, well, we match escrow.com's prices. I find that people tend to trust the law firm a little bit more. Um, escrow.com is very well known, but they – don't seem to do very complicated transactions, um, and there's nothing personalized about it. Um, if you're going to do an escrow transaction with us, you're going to uh, find that we're going to make sure it goes through. I'm going to make sure it goes through and goes through smoothly. There's not going to be any issues, and I'm going to tell both sides if there's an issue. It's not going to be you know, if they come forward and they say, you know, we're, we're not doing a contract. I'm like, you know, you really should do a contract. Um, um, we've done some very large uh, escrow transactions. I find people tend to use escrow.com or uh, some of the other escrow companies for the smaller ones because it's all online. Yeah. We uh, at one point tried to build out a online system, and reality is online systems aren't appropriate for million plus transactions. Yeah, I think escrow.com. Um, they do a great job at, at, at the deals, types of deals you're talking about, and more complex deals you're, we're just talking about on this uh, on this webinar. I think that um, to go through a, a law firm like your, your own it would be the way to go. Well, I personally agree, but I'm obviously very prejudiced. Yeah, and so, um, like I said, I think escrow.com does an amazing job of what they do as well. It's a different type of market in some ways, isn't it? Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean... It doesn't make sense to come to me for a $60, $100, or even a $1,000 domain name. Yeah. Um, you know, we're do in the midst of an escrow right now that's a five-year term that has 
particular uh, bubble payments along the way. As we get to those bubble payments, I'll be emailing all the parties and saying it's time to make the payments and in keeping everybody informed when the payments are made and when they're not and if there's any issues along the way. Um, the DNS has to change a number of different times in the transaction. I don't think that's something that escrow.com can actually handle. Yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting. So there's another question here from Matt Worth. Um, uh, he says, hi, Stephen. Thanks for taking the time to do a webinar. Is there a merit in using the domain name as the company name in the registration? And would that pass the retention of ownership as just the contact name changes? Um, that's a multi-level question. One, I don't think just putting the company name as the domain in the domain name ownership really is sufficient because you really want use. Second, when you're transferring a domain name from the previous person to the new person, you want to make sure that in the contract it includes the goodwill of the, the associated with the trademark. Um, you can really by putting, there's something called tacking that allows you to take the trademark rights from the previous owner and move it to the next owner. There has been a number of cases that specifically state that um, use of a domain name on a landing page is to some small degree trademark use. So why somebody would not transfer whatever trademark use there is, I, don't, I, I can't think of a reason. Um, I think it's a good idea to put, to, if the company name and the domain name are the same, um, it, I think it probably dissuades people, but I think there's plenty of arguments to um, argue against that it's the retention of ownership. Yeah, I've actually done that for one of my key domain names, uh, for one, one of my businesses, I have the company name is the domain name. Sure, I, yeah. look, there's nothing wrong with it. Yeah. I just think from a litigation point of view, there's multiple factors. Yeah. And that if you're ending up in litigation, the attorneys on the other side are going to bring up all those other factors and the weight of the name being uh, part of it will be not de minimis, but won't, certainly won't be everything. Yeah, you raised some interesting points there. Um, is there any other questions just to, um, because uh, I notice our time is really uh, wrapping up right now, but there's any any other questions? If there aren't any, then can I just say, Stephen, uh, it's been really good talking with you. And, good talking uh, to you too. Uh, there, there's a lot of other things we didn't touch on, which I think uh, maybe down the track, if we have, have, an, have another webinar or something like that, uh, it'd be fantastic. Um, and uh, I, I just think that there's so much to, to the, the legal side, but also so much to you. The fact that what we didn't touch on was the fact you also invest, don't you? You invest in businesses, invest in domains, all sorts of stuff as well, which is another aspect of Stephen Lieberman. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yes. yes. The fun part. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly. So, so there's a lot of, a lot of, lot of um, aspects to what you do. And uh, to be able to summarize everything down to a one hour webinar, um, is uh, you've done a remarkable job. Can I just say uh, to everyone here, thank you for joining us and thank you very much for Stephen uh, for particularly sharing his expertise. Um, and if you go to um, uh, uh, if you go to the uh, Wizbang's blog and you'll see there's a banner up there. Stephen's kindly helping support um, the blog and everything, which has been really good. You can click on that and you can go straight to his law firm page if you're after details and everything and reach out to Kim. Um, he's one of the most respected domain lawyers and litigators and so forth in the industry. And Stephen, I just want to say thank you very much for your time. Um, and it'd be great to have you back on the show again sometime. Michael, thank you very much for inviting me and I'd love to come back. And by the way, the website's APlegal.com. Yeah, APlegal.com. So. I'll make sure that uh, when I process this video that I'll put it up there for everyone so they know where to, where to reach you on. And, and it's you. really good. Okay, then thank you very much for that. And um, it's really been good having you. See you later. Thank you very much. Ciao. Okay, bye. Well, there you have it. There's Stephen Lieberman sharing really is a great tips uh, on domaining and particular legal side and dealing with uh, the contracts and so forth. 
and uh, it'd be great to be able to get him back to be able to open up and unpack some of, of his experience because uh, there's a lot to pack into one one hour. Well, um, following next week's webinar, we're going to have a lot more stuff we're going to be discussing, and uh, I hope you really enjoy it. Please don't be a stranger. Come on to Wizbang's blog and um, just ask questions about domain or suggest, like, Michael, hey, uh, what sort of topics you'd like to be able to um, discuss at a webinar or you'd like me to write on? I'd love to be able to share with you a lot of things um, about the domain industry because it's just given me so much and I'd like to be able to give back to you. Anyway, um, so feel free to comment, like me on Facebook, all that sort of stuff, and it's great to see you. Have a great week this week. Thanks a lot. Bye.